that would be like a nightmare to get locked off into uh, a non-functional uh, what I would call exile, you know? or to even be in exile, you know? that would be uh, a nightmare. Your politics, your politics are what you want to push, right? So what's your politics convince him that it's time to pick up a gun? Because, you know, if I thought that was a danger, I'd pull my gun on you and take that camera and all this film and all this motherfucking tape and burn it up, you know? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, see? Uh, I don't have to be manipulated and maneuvered into repeating what I said about if you're in a position to blow a motherfucker's game, if you're in a position to make him uh, lose control of his machine, if you're in a position to like, hurt him, then when you say, hey, motherfucker, I want to talk to you, you're going to say, what? What you want, motherfucker? You know? At least you're going to say that. You know? So many people uh, don't practice what they preach, you know? So many people are afraid of fucking with the United States of America, you know? That <clears throat> I wonder if it's possible that uh, it would be absolutely uh, incredible. Then when I encounter other people, I don't care if they're police, you know, or if they're politicians, or if they're like newspaper people, or uh, radio or TV people, you know. I don't care what kind of people they are, you know. As far as I'm concerned, they cannot be neutral. They can only be part of the problem or part of the solution, you know. As far as I'm concerned, like the neutrals are part of the problem, you know. We can go back legally according to uh, the judicial system of the pigs, or we could go back legally according to the judicial system of the people. You, mean you would trust the judicial system of the establishment enough that you go back? <coughs> I would trust uh, my attorney's words, dig? When Charles R. Gary tells me to come back and go to trial, I'll catch the first plane out of here and go to trial. And if I can come back there that way, then that's cool. Not because I think that I would get any justice in the courts, because it's very clear. It's very clear what the pigs have in store for niggas like me. Look at what happened to Bobby Seals in Chicago, how the pigs bound and gagged him, shackled him like a slave. But we have to blow their game, and we have to take advantage of every opportunity to strike a blow against this system. At 8.30 in the morning on November the 27th, I was supposed to surrender to my parole officer, and he was going to transport me to San Quentin State Prison. He was going to transfer me there because uh, I had been charged by the Alameda County Grand Jury with several violations of the law. I pleaded not guilty to the indictment, but my parole officer and uh, those who control him, uh, specifically the California Department of Corrections, the adult authority, they couldn't wait for the case to come to trial. So that on the basis of uh, merely being charged with these crimes, they used that fact to uh, violate my parole, to revoke my parole and order me returned to prison. I, uh, I took a dim view of that, you know. He is not called? No. What are you going to do now, Charles Barry? I expect him here at 9 o'clock. What if he doesn't show? What happens then, Mr. Gary, from your end of it? I continue with my legal responsibilities, whether he shows up or not. Do you make a plea for him to turn himself in now? No, I won't make any plea. My relationship with Eldridge and the Panthers have been that. I carry out my legal responsibilities, they carry out their political responsibilities, and I don't superimpose my own uh, white background to tell a black uh, militant on how he should conduct himself or comport himself. Kathleen, why do you think he would be executed in the penitentiary? Because they've made several attempts inside the penitentiary and here on the streets to execute him. Can you cite some examples of when and how that happened? Yes, April 6, 1968, Oakland, San Quentin, 1963. And the others I don't even know about. These pigs tried to kill me, shot me in my leg, and they killed Bobby Hutton. 
and they were going to kill me. And the only reason that I'm not dead this minute is because these pigs decided to shoot Bobby before they shot me. There were too many people who came out of their houses and started screaming at these pigs to stop. What good is it for me to have survived that attempt at my death if I don't give that life back to the struggling to put an end to the system that took away Bobby Hudson's life and gave death to so many other members of our party. So this life belongs to the American Revolution and that's where it will be spent. When I said I was gonna go to jail, I meant that I wasn't going to ever go to jail again in my life, you know. I meant that uh, whenever someone tried to arrest me, you know, that I was going to resist arrest. You know? Leader, uh, Pastor Long. Prison. Prison. We, uh, did a lot of people, they give me the impression that um, they think that I'm stupid or something for saying that I want to go back to the United States. And they don't seem to realize that it's a very serious thing to uh, uh, to be cut off from your own environment, to be cut off from uh, your family and your friends, to be cut off uh, from your political organization, to be cut off from everything that you identify with. Because uh, I'm enough, I'm enough of a provincial, you know, uh, so that I relate to my environment, with what I can exist and live uh, in other environments. And while I can enjoy the hospitality of other people, uh, I think it has its limitations on allowing a person to really uh, live a life that he wants to live. See, see, this is not something that just happened. I, don't, I didn't just happen to be here in Al Algiers, and I'm not here uh, just because of my own personal efforts. I'm here because uh, there are revolutionaries in America uh, who made it possible for me to be here. And I'm saying that uh, this is not the only thing that we plan to do. I could not even begin to think about going into exile to, be, to quit the fight. I could only become even more serious than I was when I was in the United States to plan very carefully to uh, make my way back to the United States so that we can strike at the monster in its own lair, to strike at the heart of the misery that we've been traveling through. And I know that for myself and for all my friends for the Black Panther Party, we would never be satisfied until the system that exists in the United States, which stretches all around the world and which is responsible for all the misery that we see, is destroyed, the system changed so that the American people can be the friends of people all over the world instead of the enemies of the people. So that even though I can have sanctuary here or in many of the other countries that I've traveled through, I would be miserable by the mere thought of uh, quitting the fight or not going back to participate in it. So that to me, this is only an added inspiration to go back and to fight and to die and to kill to bring an end to the misery that is engulfing the world. Shopping for uh, my friends back in Babylon. 
I'm getting this for Mary Ariolo. Huh? Let me buy this. Il faut faire noir. Il faut noir. Il Say that it would penetrate all those. Uh, with it, you could cut up, it, cut off his balls, you know, if he has any. <laughs> you know, this morning we went to the Vietnamese, you know, and uh, you seem to be very impressed with their whole way, manner, style. And when we were outside, you were flashing your knife and opening and closing it. Doesn't it seem something very different about your style and their style, or maybe even a opposition between the two, like they're very low-key. You said they never talk about fighting except they do it. It's not good to talk about to talk about fighting, you know, unless you fight, you see. Yeah, but they fight and they don't talk much about it, you know. They're very matter of fact. Well, they, they talk about it, you know. Yeah, well, they, they talk about it, you know. They're but, very um, honest. And, uh, it's like the claim, you see, of uh, the Cubans that uh, while Fidel was in the mountains, he didn't make any speeches, you know. But that before he went to the mountains, he made speeches, you know? So uh, it's only a question of making a transition, you know? And I don't, th I don't think it's a complicated process or that it, you know, it's so confusing that it, re it requires uh, uh, philosophical analysis, you know? Right, and what do the Panthers stand for? Just killing, just offering the pig, you know, violence, death, negative. <laughs> negative, 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 you know? No, I'm interested in uh, a centralized North American Liberation Front, you know. I'm interested in some uh, machinery, you know, yeah. uh, that would be conspiratorial and deadly. You but know? you always talk about killing, yet the Panthers have a Breakfast for Children program and they have oh, self-defense. Like, no, I don't, uh, okay, we have all that, okay. I say, I don't think that we have to protect this, you know. I don't think we have to put on like a positive image, you know. Because we put on a positive image today, you know, and in the New York Times and Life magazine and Newsweek and Donald Duck and television, you know, yeah. in two or three days, man, they'll have you back in the same bag. No, it's you know? not a question of faking it, but like Huey Newton says, you, you know, the party's got to be the oxen that the people ride. Yeah. But I, I don't think and you have no to overemphasize that. No revolutionary movement's been able to make it without serving the people. Huey Newton said that. You don't have to overemphasize that. No, but a lot because of It is a fact. It is a fact that the Black Panther Party has these things, and it does these things, and it says these things, you see? Yeah, but they're not reported, and that's why it's why? important to stress it, you know? Because who's interested in uh, what the pigs of the mass media report, you know? Who's interested in what they do, you know? I'm only interested in how to counter that, you know? Yeah, well, that's what we're And not counter it by uh, overemphasizing an apologetic approach to that, you know? We have a Breakfast for Children program, you know? But that's not uh, what the Black Panther Party is all about, you see. I don't agree with saying that the Black Panther Party uh, supports breakfast for children, and that's all that we're about, you know. Don't talk about this other thing. No. No. The Black Panther Party is for overthrowing the United States government. Presumably because you're going to do some positive things for people. You know, what do the really Black Panthers do to show that they're not racist? I think that everything they do shows that, you know. How? Like sitting here talking to you, for instance, you know. Why? Or listening to your questions, you know. Because why would I listen to a hunky or a beast or a devil, <laughs> you know, or Blue a Klux Klan, blue-eyed, blue <laughs> hairy-faced uh, European, you know? Mother country radical. You know, like, you know, what, what relevance could anything that you say have, you know? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I talk to you because uh, I think that... Uh, it's not racist you have so much as negative. On the subject, right. you know? It's not racist as much as negative. People say the Panthers just want to destroy it. Just no. want to attack, just we, we, hate, no, no. just want to kill. No, that would be positive, you know. Why? Just they, ne they, never, no, they never charge us with saying that we want to kill. Because we say that very clearly, that we want to kill pigs, you yeah. But they say that uh, the black pastors want to kill all white babies, you know. Yeah. So that all the white mothers get uptight, you know? And lay awake at night and... Uh, argue with these cats and make them want to do something to Black Panthers, you know? No, but you talk a lot about killing, assassination, and then you, on the other hand, you say you're a Marxist, you know? 
And most Marxists have never believed in terror. They never believe in terrorism. <laughs> most Marxists? Who cares what most Marxists believe? Uh, I mean, uh, it's consider Marx is considered terrorism and adventurous. Well, let's talk right? about let's talk about the members of the First International who was not organized by uh, Marxists but by Karl Marx himself. All right. All right. And uh, a member of the First International was Bakunin. You see. And he, he wrote a beautiful document uh, that the Black Panther Party saw fit to issue as a pamphlet, you know, entitled The Catechism of the Revolutionists, you know. And in this catechism, like, uh, the first thing he says, the first line of the catechism says that a revolutionary is a doomed man. just had a baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How does it feel to be a mother? It feels fine. You mean to be relieved of that load? <laughs> the bigger she got, the more peace I got. What was your baby? A girl or a boy? Or did you look? The whole world wants to know about your baby. In particular, Ali Oto and No Dick Rehead, <laughs> Roy Wilkins. <laughs> Okay. The Eldridge is very reckless to me. I mean, he doesn't take security precautions. He takes uh, he takes everything so lightly. I mean, the conditions he dealt with in the penitentiary is so much more dangerous than what he was dealing with outside that he really didn't take things too seriously. And I would worry uh, about him and what would happen to him, you know, every night because. Uh, Last time I saw him might have been the last time. But uh, once you make a decision uh, that you're going to uh, engage in the revolution fully, and that becomes your life, then uh, whatever fear you have, that's just uh, part of the terrain. After uh, Eldridge was shot and sent to the penitentiary, and I began just doing everything and anything I possibly could to uh, build a movement uh, to uh, get him out, because uh, I know he would have been killed in prison. I mean, they tried to kill him before in prison. They tried to give him shock treatment to destroy him. Uh, they tried to kill him on the streets. Uh, and there was no question about it, that uh, if they got him in prison, they set people up in prison. They'll say another convict. I mean, look, they killed Malcolm out in broad daylight. Bunchy was killed out in broad daylight. The penitentiary, you don't have any audience. Uh, you don't have to come up with any excuses. There's no case. That's very clear. But it's not only that. I mean, uh, it's not only because uh, you'd be killed that you don't want to go to prison. I mean, who, who wants to... Elders doesn't need to spend any time in prison. I mean, he spent off and on 20 years of his life in prison. So, uh, I mean, I think he, anything he possibly gained or possibly wanted or possibly could have done in prison, he'd already done. There's no reason in the world that he should go to prison. Boo. <laughs> what you doing, man? <laughs> when I left the United States, I had no idea that I would end up in Algeria. But I think that it was a very fortunate coming to Algeria at the time of the festival and to receive an invitation to participate in the festival, to have the opportunity to establish the Afro-American Center, which we opened for the festival, and which gave us an opportunity to make ourselves known to the other uh, liberation movements who were brought together by the festival. The stage was set. People came here specifically to check each other out, to see what was going on, and to get some idea as to which movements they could relate to, which one they wanted to relate to. I think the, your center had a very big success. Oh, you were very And uh, you showed to uh, our uh, uh, population how an, a, a cultural expression could uh, contribute to uh, uh, a political, uh, to a political struggle, and that is very important. Oh, 
There were many people uh, a few years ago who thought that all, all you had to do in the United States, black people, was to start wearing African clothes, you know, let your hair go long, yes. and uh, then you'll be liberated, you'll be free. And we found that but you're still oppressed, and you still need to struggle, so that uh, the only culture that is relevant is a revolutionary culture. This morning, I received a phone call from our chairman, Bobby Seale. Ce matin, j'ai reçu un coup de téléphone de, no, de notre président, uh, Bobby Seale. Uh, he was calling from Oakland, California, in the United States. Il téléphonait de Oakland, en Californie, uh, aux États-Unis. And he said that the district attorney of New York State, et il a dit que, la, que le chef de la police de l'État de New York, had stated in uh, television and over the radio, a déclaré sur les antennes de la radio et, sur la et à la télévision that within 48 hours he was going to have every member of the Black Panther Party in the state of New York behind bars. Et il a dit sur les antennes de la radio et la télévision que dans les 48 heures, tous les militants du parti de la Panthère Noire dans l'État de New York seraient euh, mis en prison. Now, this, this is a... Uh... I think this telephone call serves to clarify the difference between what is happening here in Algeria, where we are participating in this cultural festival, and what's happening in Babylon. Je pense que ce coup de téléphone a démontré la différence qui existe entre la situation ici en Algérie, où nous participons à, au festival panafricain, à, à la différence qui existe entre cette situation-là et la situation là-bas euh, dans Babylone. In Babylon, we're involved in a struggle for our survival. In Babylon, the fight that we're in is a fight for our survival. We came over here to do what we can to communicate to you what's happening in our struggle in the United States. We came here to do what we can to communicate to you what's happening in our struggle in the United States. De vous expliquer, de vous apprendre ce qui se passe aux États-Unis. And to learn uh, what is happening over here, and what have been the successes, and what have been the failures, and what are the dangers that we must be aware of. Et nous sommes venus aussi pour essayer d'apprendre uh, quel est votre combat, quels ont été vos problèmes, quels sont vos problèmes, quelles sont les, les erreurs, uh, ou quels sont les dangers qu'il nous faudra éviter. I think the black culture is racist and anti-white. <laughs> We work, we work with uh, anti-war organizations in the white community in the United States, and we work with white revolutionaries, we have these relationships, and we know what we're doing, they know what we're doing, you're the one who don't know what we're doing. We would not come over here to Algeria and try to dictate to you how you should run your country or how you should run your liberation struggle. And we cannot have you dictate that way to us. We want to know how you, black Americans, are being, going about with this program because this is the last vestige of imperialism or what we call neocolonialism, which we must wipe out in Africa, and you two should do something about. So tell us what you have done about it. We want to know how the American government is on this problem because it needs to be the last vestige of imperialism and neocolonialism to be erased from Africa. Et nous voulons savoir ce que vous, Afro-Américains, vous allez faire pour cela. I want you to know that we're very glad to see the imperialists and colonists run out of Africa. Je veux que vous sachiez que nous sommes très heureux de voir les impérialistes et les colonialistes expulsés de l'Afrique.
rolled the Black Panther Party to help destroy Babylon, the system of Babylon, so that the whole world would be liberated because we recognize that since the United States of America is the backbone of oppression in the world, that the blows that we strike against the empire there will also aid the liberation struggles in Africa, Asia, and Latin America as we aid ourselves in Babylon. Donc, notre but, c'est la destruction du système capitaliste chez nous, parce que nous sommes conscients que le système américain représente la colonne vertébrale de l'impérialisme américain qui s'étend partout dans le monde, et que si nous le détruisons chez nous, nous le détruirons également partout en Amérique latine, en Afrique et en Asie. Je voudrais savoir aussi euh, quels sont les, les moyens qu'ils emploient pour, euh, pour, euh, pour parvenir à leur but. Uniquement le fusil. Yes, if it's only guns. Yes, if it's only guns. And bombs, you know, guns, just like you had to do it here. The way you did it here, with, with the understanding of the problem, with the ideology for liberation, and with fighting men who would put the ideology into practice. They want to fight like you have fought here, with the same ideology and for the same goal. C'est bon, oui, vous dites. Alors, qu'est-ce que tu fais Il a dit, c'est bon, qu'est-ce que je peux dire Donc, je ne pense pas que c'est mal de vouloir overthrow le uh, gouvernement des États-Unis, parce que c'est la distinction entre la violence révolutionnaire et la violence révolutionnaire. La distinction entre une juste guerre et une injuste guerre. C'est ce que nous disons dans le Black Panther Party quand nous disons que l'oppresseur has no rights which the oppressed are bound to respect. The Black Panther Party proudly joins hands with the liberation movements of the third world. This is one of the things that the leaders of armed liberation struggles, they liked about the Black Panther Party, that the Black Panther Party was not a one-man organization. Because in the past, uh, black organizations in the United States have tended to be one-man organizations that united around a charismatic leader and that it did not have any structure to ensure the perpetuation and the continuity of the organization after uh, the imprisonment or the death or some other mishap to the leader. So that when you have uh, the leaders of armed liberation struggles, whom you know are, are serious and whom you know do not uh, waste words and give out false praise, and they talk to you and they show you that they have detailed knowledge and information about what you're doing, and they approve of it, and not only approve of it, but offer uh, very constructive uh, suggestions how to improve your approach to the situation. Uh, the, you cannot help but being very pleased. And this was one of the first times, some of the conversations that I've had in Africa, that I've uh, been very glad to receive constructive criticism. I mean, they were very uh, concerned about the importance of structuring uh, the revolution. Another thing that was very important to emphasize more the uh, internationalist aspect of our struggle. One of the best Haiti. Mario Dandrade, Angola. Mario Dalmeida, Angola. Armando Gibuza, Mozambique. Steven Ngomo, Zimbabwe. Oscar Monteiro, Mozambique. Quase isso que eu nessa África. Baby D, Babylon. Alves Cleaver, Afro America. Emory Douglas, Afro-American. David Hilliard, Afro-American. Raymond Hewitt, Afro-American. Julian Herbe, Afro-American. The meeting today, really, is a formal get-together of all the brothers who are involved in the struggle <coughs> in various parts of uh, this continent and various parts uh, in America. And uh, it is a very important occasion on which we exchange views. And of course, as you know, uh, these struggles are struggles that are very interlinked, not only because of the common experience of uh, colonization, uh, but also because the strategy of the opposition is a coordinated one. And therefore it becomes imperative for all of us 
to coordinate this struggle and we get together today uh, is really to uh, exchange those views, talk to each other, know each other, and indeed uh, we have just performed a ceremony which is uh, very common to eat uh, uh, in these dishes. Of course, the significance of these uh, dishes is a symbol of uh, our unity. Uh, I'll first ask a question from our brothers in America. Uh, how do they see the perspectives of the revolution in America? We see uh, the people struggling, turning more and more towards uh, armed struggle. Now, we know that uh, people have had very uh, disappointing experiences uh, struggling in urban situations. And we're in a situation where uh, we cannot really rely upon the experiences uh, of others in that regard. There are quite a few uh, lessons that we can draw from the experiences of others, but we're confronted by an unprecedented situation, a highly uh, industrialized, highly uh, mechanized and mobile uh, military establishment that we cannot hope to match. And the only thing that uh, we can say is that, as uh, our chairman Bobby Seale always says, that the best care package that we can send to the other uh, liberation struggles around the world is the work that we do at home. We are following the struggle of our Afro-American brothers in the United States, and I'm sure they are also following our struggles. But the people of Zimbabwe have taken up arms, and we are facing a common enemy, and it is this common enemy which we must uh, all crush if uh, uh, our Af Afro-American uh, brothers score success in the United States. That success is not only theirs, it is ours too. The Mozambican people, as I have said here, are decided to fight and have been fighting up to now and in such a way that uh, we have liberated one-fifth of our country and our struggle is developing in such a way that uh, now we are we have opened a new front in that province. In so-called Portuguese Guinea, the liberation movement has, in the last seven years, liberated two-thirds of the country. In Angola, in Mozambique, and in Guinea, our brothers are fighting against Portugal and her allies. The planes, the guns, the napalm bombs the Portuguese use in their criminal war are from the NATO arsenal. They are made in France, in Italy, in Germany, and in the United States. This is no mere coincidence. These leaders of the free world, these champions of Christian values, are partners of Portugal in the exploitation of our resources, of our labor, and in the murder of our people. This means that the system of imperialism, with its web of military bases, has brought all the reactionary, colonialist, and neo-colonialist forces into a worldwide alliance. It is against this alliance that all the masses that have been exploited for centuries must fight together in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, and inside the United States itself. There lies the solidarity we feel with our brothers in the Black Panther Party. The more that movement grows, the more the revolutionary struggle in the United States develops, the easier will be our fight. Less planes, less guns, Less bullets will be furnished to Portugal, to South Africa, to Rhodesia, and the closer will be our victory. important factor here that uh, our struggle is a revolutionary one. It is not a struggle against uh, the hairy fairy tale of uh, race, but against a structure. We have a particular problem in the United States and that uh, the cultural question is put before the question of economics and class. So that uh, there are black lackeys there who under the name of revolution, uh, trying to instigate race war, 
which would further the fascism that now exists in America. We don't separate the question of uh, culture and politics into different compartments, and that the culture is subordinate to the politics so that the only culture of the oppressed can be rebellion and revolution, and that uh, we are quite clear on the question of uh, negritude, black awareness, and all this other madness perpetrated by the imperialist state power structure using its black lackeys uh, in Babylon and around the world. The culture is nothing. It's nowhere. Culture is the gun. <laughs> and uh, the, the struggle is international, it is continental, it is revolutionary, and therefore calls on all of us to define very clearly our objectives. And our objectives are power to the people. Right on. Right on. Right on. A lot of people uh, leave the United States and go off into other uh, parts revolutionary parts of the world because they think that they can go there and they can get training, you know. They want to learn how to uh, use guns and use bombs so they can go back to the United States and to fight. But I think that's uh, kind of, uh, as a matter of fact, I know now, uh, after traveling around to many of the revolutionary parts of the world, that the best, uh, the best bet for American revolutionaries is to realize that they're going to have to make the revolution themselves, that they cannot depend upon other people to make the revolution for them, and that they can no longer uh, expect other people to do their dying for them or their killing. So that what they have to do is to recognize that all of the uh, conditions and all of the material uh, for waging a revolutionary struggle exists in the United States. Uh, the United States uh, arms and finances all of the uh, oppressive regimes around the world. The guns and the bombs are made in the United States. And the uh, knowledge for training uh, uh, fighters also exists in the United States. So it's only a question of assembling the material there and making a revolution uh, that I would like to call like the proud revolution. I think we can make a very proud revolution. I think the revolution in the United States is the most important revolution uh, that the world has to make. Because until there is a revolution in the United States, uh, the rest of the uh, world that's making a revolution will not really be able to experience it in its full potential or in its totality. Because of uh, the activities of the United States forces uh, the revolutionary countries to uh, proportion large uh, sums of money for defense, uh, it distorts the entire concept of a revolutionary economy. Those whom prefer the the fact that other mieux for non seulement pour libérer notre pays, mais encore pour contribuer de notre part à la lutte commune de tous les opprimés et de tous les pays. I know that I speak for uh, a great number of Americans see, and, uh, in the anti-war movement. We join hands with the Vietnamese people because the Vietnamese people are fighting the pigs of the power structure. And we're fighting the pigs of the power structure and we're both oppressed. We're both dying. And we both know that we must put an end to this. We need each other, and we love each other. It's a bag, with the price of the American aviation, abattu and destroyed au sol, au superstar. That's the first uh, good use that I've ever seen those war materials put to. <laughs> uh, I think you better put it here. Put it, put it on here. I will, I will give this to my wife. Ah, ah, no, no, no. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
hope to receive you in liberated Saigon. Tell me that I hope to receive them in Washington, D.C. And Washington. <laughs> All power to the people. Another people coming. Yankees don't know that it's time to get out of Vietnam. You did? And they don't know that it's time to stop fucking with the Black Panther Party, you know? And they did not take the American people into consideration in their calculations. And specifically, they did not take black people in America into their considerations. They thought that they would always be able to control black people, you did. They thought that, like Al Yoto says, everybody has their price. Because he's a gangster, you did. So he can say that because he really believes that. And so they actually think that they could buy the black revolution out. They think that, you know. And they have many different sops to throw out the people to see which one you would grab, you did. And they, they will be able to grab anyone, you did, who reaches out for anything that they offer. And so far, it is a fact that they have been able to throw something out for every level of the black revolution to come along thus far except the Black Panther Party. And that's, that's where the whole difference is, you dig? But why? Why? Because the Black Panther Party is revolutionary. If you get away from the uh, false belief that uh, revolution is, is only taking place when people are shooting or are burning down buildings, then you can say, well, there are a lot of people in the United States who don't indulge in that. But if you realize that uh, part of the revolutionary process is in the destruction of uh, the values that prop up a decadent system, uh, many forms that the system can be sabotaged. I think there are many people who are involved in that uh, who don't even know that they're revolutionary. There are many people who are actually uh, doing great work to uh, set, the, set the stage for the violent phase of the revolution. See? I don't even understand the position of the Panthers right now. You're saying that, this, that the Panthers are getting ready for armed struggle? No, it wasn't. It was, it was used to say uh, self-defense. Yeah. The Panther program uh, is structured around an either-or principle, you know? It says, like, either you do this or we do this. Either you do this or we do this. It's, a, it's, all, it's like a proposal, an alternative. And uh, that's the dynamic. So that's why each of those principles, each of those points are dynamic, you know. That's why the program lives, you know. And, uh, yeah, but I still don't understand. I mean, are the Panthers yeah. player prepared for guerrilla warfare now? Or is it, you talk about arms struggle? I mean, I'm genuinely confused on that, on well, what their position we're, is. We're confused too, you know, because uh, <coughs> we know that. The Black Panther Party cannot make a revolution by itself, you know? We know that uh, the majority of the people in the United States are like white people, you know? And we know that in order to have a revolution, uh, they're going to have to uh, become revolutionaries, you know? So that it's not a question of are the Panthers prepared for guerrilla warfare. It's uh, are white people becoming revolutionary, you know? I mean, that's the question to ask, you know? Do you think there are uh, objective conditions which would allow a majority of white people to become revolutionaries now? Enough so that they would sacrifice everything in a, in a guerrilla struggle? There's not that many black people right now to prepare for that, you see? But uh, if the circumstances can be altered, you did, to bring about those conditions. The violence that has always been perpetrated against black people in the United States keep them in their place has now been turned upon white people also. These people were raised to believe that they had certain freedoms. And in Berkeley, when the young people tried to make themselves a part, people's part, these vicious Gestapo police are unleashed upon them. And they find themselves trapped. in Chicago, where they went to the Democratic Convention to protest the insane war policies 
of the Johnson administration. And they were treated the same as black people have been treated when they demand their rights. So that they now confront the grim reality that now they have no choice either. That they must either accept this oppression or they must fight against it and overcome it. Ladies and gentlemen, I came here from San Francisco to talk to you about Hubert Horatio Humphrey. I came here to talk to you about the man who has been for 20 years, right up to the present time, the articulate exponent of the aspirations of the human heart for the young, for the old, and for those of us in between. And they see the governor of the state of California unleashing the National Guard upon them and smiling mafioso alioto, wading through the violence perpetrated against the people, telling the people that everything is all right when the people know that everything is wrong. We found it was necessary to stop talking about white people, you know, or at least to try to keep in focus, you know, to stop thinking in terms of black people and white people, you know. Because we found that uh, we had enemies in the black community that were just as deadly as our enemies in the white community. So the white community and black community became meaningless categories for us, you know. So we had to start talking about revolutionaries and reactionaries, which has nothing to do with color, you know. We had to start talking about counter-revolutionaries. Senator McClellan had the nerve to hold some hearings on the Black Panther Party. Now, I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, and Senator McClellan is a senator from Arkansas. He is a man who is in office by virtue of disenfranchising black people, gerrymandering voting districts, and maintaining himself in power by denying black people and poor white people the true political expression provide breakfast with, for children with food they steal and with the money they get and food they get from shakedown of merchants. And this criminal presided over a committee that was investigating the righteous revolutionary political activity of the Black Panther Party. The shit is upside down and inside out. We have to deal with that. I believe it'll condone it. The children hustled into the small rooms off to the side of the church for eggs, pancakes, grits, sausage, bacon, toast, coffee, milk, and sometimes juice. The children were there for a free breakfast from the black militant organization, and they were being well fed with both food and politics. Marcia Turner, a young Panther leader, led the youngsters in a song that had these lyrics, and I quote, there's a pig upon the hill. If you don't shoot him, the Panthers will. And they got Huey in the jail. They won't let him out on bail, end of quote. And after each verse, as in the old army march song, she would ask the kids to sound off, free Huey. At another point during the breakfast at St. Augustine's, the kids joined in a repeating after a husky-throated Panther I am a revolutionary. I love Huey P. Newton. I love Eldridge Cleaver. I love Bobby Seale. I love being a revolutionary. I feel good off the pigs. Power to the people. And the fatal shooting of Bobby Hutton by Oakland police. The Oakland police stated that they were fired upon during a routine investigation of a suspicious person, and after a short search, Gunner cornered Hutton and Eldridge Cleaver in the basement of a nearby house. A fierce gun battle ensued, which lasted for hours before Hutton and Cleaver surrendered to the police. Cleaver's claim is that Hutton was shot down by police as he stumbled toward a police car, which was to take him to headquarters. 
His sudden and violent death made him an instant martyr for the Panthers. Tributes, eulogies, and a funeral attended by 1,200 persons, including movie star Marlon Brando, helped to publicize nationally the Panthers' campaign against the Oakland police. The Panthers get a lot of mileage from their martyrs in the form of news coverage in both local and national press, as well as the underground Communist Party newspapers. Each event gives the Panthers another opportunity to spout their line of revolution in the white mother country and national liberation in the black colony. The Panther militants in Oakland became involved in the Poor People's March from Oakland. They were represented at a rally held in Oakland Auditorium by Ralph Abernathy, and it is reported that they played a significant role in organizing the march on Washington from Oakland. Panthers were among the residents of Resurrection City and managed to be identified as such. The Panthers became associated with the black boycott of the Olympic Games organized by Harry Edwards, an associate professor at San Jose College in California. A coalition between the Black Panthers and the Peace and Freedom Party became clear at the Peace and Freedom Founding Convention held on March 16, 1968 in Richmond, California. The Peace and Freedom Party joined with the Black Panther Party and the Stop the Draft Week organizers. In spite of their mistrust for some white radicals, the Panthers have formed a new and open alliance with the Students for a Democratic Society. were made in public. Were made in public. But you feel constrained not to make use of the same language here. I wouldn't care to. You wouldn't care to. Very well, you may indicate where the language is so vile that you don't want to repeat it and then continue with this quote that you have. All right, sir. Some of the excerpts uh, from Robert Brown's uh, speech are as follows. We are going to clean this mother obscenity town out. I mean, we're dealing with strategy. The only way for America to be free is to obscenity up this country. The only way to obscenity up this country is to cut off vital supply lines. The language that the brothers on the block, the language that they use is like legitimate as far as I'm concerned. Right? So when they tell you that in order to talk about politics, you have to uh, go off into Oxford English, they immediately uh, make it impossible for certain people to participate in those politics. So that uh, by saying fuck Ronald Reagan, you know, or, that, or Richard Nixon, this is a political statement that a lot of people that I know and relate to could make. They could say that. But when they're told that you can't say that in public, you know, that means that there's a lot of politics that they can't discuss. So I would never uh, clean up my language in order to impress pigs or in order to conform to uh, the shadows of Victorian morality. I say, fuck the Queen of England, you know? And fuck Queen Victoria in her bones, you dig? But what's all this bullshit about getting uptight about language? Hypocritical motherfuckers like Max Rafferty and Ronald Reagan, their very names, to me, are more repulsive than any so-called profane expression that I've ever heard. When I want to put a cat down, I call him a Ronald Reagan. <laughs> I'm going to talk the way I want to talk. But the fact that the pigs of the power structure don't like it 
makes me want to do it. I just want to say, fuck, 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 fuck. So I'm going to ask you to sing a song. The name of the song is Fuck Ronald Reagan. Uh, one, two, three, four, and you come out here on the downbeat. Is there any circumstance that you would approve of uh, Mr. Cleaver lecturing in the classroom under any circumstance? Me personally? Not one. One, two, three, four. Fuck Ronald Reagan! Fuck Ronald Reagan! Fuck Ronald Reagan! One, two, three, four. Fuck all the pigs! Fuck all the pigs! Fuck all the pigs! And I hope that I can gain uh, the respect uh, and I hope eventually the friendship of black citizens and other Americans. Richard Nixon has the nerve to say that some black people don't like him. I hate Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon is a dangerous man. And Richard Nixon has hydrogen bombs to play with. Richard Nixon has the lives of all the people in the world to play with. And he has supreme power. The United States government today is a criminal government that is the enemy of the people, the number one enemy of the peoples of the whole world. All of our politicians, the leaders of our country, criminals, from lynching Baines Johnson to Mayor Daley of Chicago, all these petty legislators and even the priests and the preachers, those who send the boys off to war with the blessings of the Lord. Look at these people, butchered and maimed in their own land by aggressors from thousands of miles away. For what? These people represent no threat to me or to anyone that I know. They want to be free. They want to control their own country, control their own government. And why shouldn't they have that? There is no one in the United States of America who is walking around so-called free and alive who is not guilty of the slaughter of these people. Either you struggle against this, either you stop this, or you are guilty of allowing it to happen. You are guilty of these murders. You are guilty of this slaughter. You're guilty of this mangling destruction of human beings. Martin Luther King said that the U.S. government is the major purveyor of violence in the world today. And Martin Luther King said that. And Martin Luther King was murdered. The United States government uses violence as an instrument of its policy enforces criminal policies with criminal violence. And yet, when the people oppose these criminal policies, the government accuses them of being criminals, calling members of the Black Panther Party hoodlums and criminals, says no to these criminal policies. Some of the demands mentioned in this 10-point program are such wants as housing, food, and education for the black people. Other demands, however, are such as to set free all black men from all jails and prisons in this country and to exempt all black men from military service. Working from their premise that none of their demands are being met by the so-called establishment, Black Panther speakers have on numerous occasions castigated the federal government as being imperialistic and oppressive. Like the Black Panther Party has one basic principle that it always maintains uh, as its take it off point, that every man, woman, and child has an absolute right to the best and the highest standard of living, quantitatively and qualitatively, that human wisdom and technology is capable of providing, period. See? You sound as though you might be a Marxist, are you? Um, 
that word is very controversial, uh, even among the Marxists, matter of fact, uh, that I'm a revolutionary and uh, I believe that people should control uh, the country, their lives, and also the means of production. Uh, I believe that the people should share uh, in the wealth uh, that they produce with their labor. And uh, I think this is uh, essential in order for black people to get their share of the wealth, that uh, we've been used as tools of production ever since, our, uh, uh, ever since we've been brought to this country in 1619. When we first organized the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, you say, Bobby, he says, we're going to draw up a basic platform. If it's just a basic platform that the mothers who struggle hard to raise us, that the fathers who worked hard, that the young brothers in school who come out of school semi-literate, you say, we want freedom, we want power to determine the destiny of our black community. Full employment for our people. Number three, we want housing fit decent housing, fit for shelter of human beings. Number four, want all black men to be exempt from military service. Number five, <laughs> we, we want decent education for our black people in our community that teaches us the true nature of this decadent racist society. Number six, we want an end to the robbery are the white racist businessmen of black people and black people in their, in their communities. Number seven, we want an immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. <laughs> Number eight, we want all black men held in county, state, federal jails and prisons to be released because they have not had a fair trial because they've been tried by all white juries and that's just like being tried in Germany being a Jew. And number 10, he would say, let's just summarize it. We want housing, we want clothing, we want education, we want justice, and we want peace. Have you ever stood in the darkness of night, screaming silently you're a man? Have you ever hoped that a time would come when your voice could be heard in a noonday sun? Have you waited so long till your unheard song has stripped away your very soul? Well then believe it, my friend, that this silence can end. We'll just have to get guns and be men. Has a cry to live when your brain is dead? Made your body tremble so? And have unseen chains of too many years hurt you so bad till you can't shed tears? Have so many bows from so many mouths made you know? That words are just words. Well, then believe it, my friend. That this silence can end. We'll just have to get guns and be men. You know that dignity, not just equality, is what makes a man a man. And so you laugh at laws passed by a silly lot tell you to give thanks for what you've already got and you can't go on with this time-worn song that just won't change the way you feel well you believe it my friend that this silence can end we'll just have to get guns and be men you don't want to think you just want to drink both the sweet wine and the gall You've been burning inside for so long a while Till your old time grin is now a crazed man's smile And the goal so clear and the time so near You'll make it or you break the plow Well then believe it my friend That this silence can end We'll just have to get guns and be men Yes, it's time you know who you really are. 
Then I try whitewash the truth. You're a man, you see, that a man must be. Whatever he'll be or he won't be free. If he's bound up tight, he'll hold back the night. And there won't be no light for day. So you believe it, my friend, that this silence can end. We'll just have to get guns and even. What do you think is going to happen to me? Well, yeah, that, that depends on certain decisions that, that uh, you make in the next uh, few months about what kind of role you're going to play, where you're going to go, what you're going to do. Uh, if you uh, decide to do some of the things you say you're going to do about returning and so forth, then I think uh, um, in a very short time you'll probably be killed or back in jail. There's no question that... Uh, you know, that they would be interested. Uh, you've been effective. You've been at this uh, festival. You emerged as probably the most important person at the festival as far as getting a point of view across. You, uh, from their point of view, embarrassed them, uh, hurt their politics, hurt their moves into Africa, into the Arab world. You're a menace to them. And um, even, as I say, with the best security measures, uh, they can't succeed in, in uh, killing you. And so it's a very depressing forecast. So the level you're saying that... Uh if I go back to Babylon and do what I want to do, then I'll probably get caught and killed. Yeah. If I stay out here, You're I'll probably, probably get caught and killed. Yeah. So that uh, in a situation, I want, I agree with that, you know. I like that choice, you know. I think that's the most effective thing that one can do. If we have no choice. We are confronted by a monstrous system, and we either submit to the monster or we struggle against the monster. People ask questions like, don't you think there are other alternatives besides violence? Why are you hung up on violence? Why do you choose violence? And it seems to me that they're totally unaware of what's going on around them. I don't see any choice in this matter. We're the generation that's going to move in a decisive manner to put an end to it at any price, at any cost. Call us suicidal, we don't care. We don't mind dying. Many of us are dying. But in the past, we died for free. But from here on in, we're going to make our deaths explicit. Who can deny that America's in trouble? Who can deny that? Who could look at what's going on and say that, well, this is normal, this is ordinary? Who could look at the police murdering Brother Fred Hampton in his sleep and say that, well, this is part of our life. Who could look at that and say that there's not something wrong? Well, when you see that this is wrong and when you don't accept that, what are you supposed to do? I don't accept it. I don't have to accept it. And I have a right to do something about it. And not only do I have a right, I have a duty.